Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India carry on with the discussion on uh, spectroscopy the one we started last time. So in the last class we looked at uh, a very basic uh, you know a set of very basic constants which are Einstein's coefficients a and b where a resembles or a represents the spontaneous emission and b corresponds to the stimulated one right. So absorption can only be stimulated because only if you have light will or if you have energy density coming in will the molecule absorb and go up to the excited state. So absorption has no counterpart or no similar counterpart as stimulated or spontaneous emission right. So there is nothing as spontaneous absorption, absorption is always based on absorption of light. On the contrary there are two ways uh, uh, that molecules can come down, one is stimulated that means the light you are shining itself stimulates the transition from the upper state to the lower state and the other one is spontaneous that means you do not need any energy density the molecule itself comes down right. And then we went on uh, to see that based on a certain derivation taking equilibrium Boltzmann population into consideration that there was a ratio A to 1 over B to 1 right and we saw that this was proportional to nu cubed and this and thus we said that the higher the frequency that means the higher the energy lower the wavelength, the higher is the probability of having spontaneous emission over stimulated emission and that is why because lasers are based on the principle of stimulated emission it is so hard to get lasers which lays in the UV just because of this right, I, this you cannot avoid ok. So based on this then we move forward and started discussing another aspect which is very fundamental to spectroscopy which is Frank Condon. Now we are talking about electronic spectroscopy out here. So this is what we said, so if you are given you, you see all these things we had written in the last class, if you are given two uh, electronic states one is S0 which is the ground electronic state right singlet, and the other one is S1 the excited singlet electronic state. Now these are just examples right this is just uh, there can be many other states out there too so but let's start with the very simplest one okay transition is always vertical in nature right this is what we're looking at a vertical transition this one the crossed one is a slanting transition it should not be having any slope the basic premise behind this being that electrons are much lighter than what your nuclei so when you are having a vertical transition during the vertical transition your R is not changing where R is what the internuclear distance that means even before the nuclei can respond to that perturbation your electrons have already moved to the higher state that is why your transition is always vertical that is why it is called a vertical transition ok. Now this has many consequences you will see as we uh, go on discussing. But you know there is also a fundamental uh, issue but before going there just to make the point along with along with the electronic states which are S0 and S1 the border line which are the electronic states you also have these lines right these lines going across the electronic states these are the vibrational states as uh, shown out here. For, so you will be having vibrational states for the ground electronic state, vibrational states for the excited electronic state and whatever electronic state you consider every electronic state would be associated with a set of vibration levels and then obviously the vibration levels will al also be having rotation levels right all those things. But here we are mainly concerned about uh, electronic and vibrational. Now so you can understand one thing that if I am going to do an electronic transition 
That means if I'm going to do a transition from S0 to S1, now just keep, these in, uh, keep this thing in mind. If I'm going to do a transition from S0 to S1, I'm not only going to change my electronic excited state going from S0 to S1, but along with that, I also have, depending upon how my nuclear geometry changes, I'll show that to you later, I will also have a probability, a finite probability of populating vibration levels or higher vibration levels in your excited electronic state. Right? Because in the low electronic state, you have V is equal to many. Right? Can V be 0? The quantum number V cannot be 0? The quantum V cannot be 0? It can be 0, right? So, the quantum V can be 0. So, you can have 0 to n for S0, you can have also 0 to n for S1, 0 to n for S2, and so on, because each electronic state is associated with a set of vibration energy levels. So, that is why, that is why. I hope you have come across this word. There are certain group of transitions known as vibronic transitions. So, vibronic transitions, if you split the word, it would refer to vibrational, that is where the V I B R comes from, and O N I C comes from electronic. So, vibronic means a combined vibration and electronic transition. Okay? So, keep this in mind, we will come across this very soon. Now, the fundamental thing that I was talking about, okay, you are given a set of electronic states S0 and S1 and you are asked this question. The question you are asked is, what is the transition probability? What is the transition probability of this compound making a transition from S0 to S1? How would you figure that out or on what quantum mechanical parameters should it depend? Okay. Now, this can be derived. What we will do is we will actually go through the derivation and you will see how fundamental it is to spectroscopy, special electronic spectroscopy and what are the different components that come out and why it is called a vibronic transition, not only an electronic transition. Okay. So, let us look at that. So, what you are going to do now is we are again going to look at Frank Condon principle. And here we are going to introduce something known as transition moment. So, as you can understand, the transition moment, the transition comes from the transition from one state to the other state, right? And where does the moment come from? Where have we heard this moment before? <coughs> the moment comes from the dipole moment, right? So, it must be, so there must be a combination of this transition along with a change in electron density or electron distribution. You know that is what would give rise to a change in your moment. So, that is why it is called a transition moment. Okay. Now, where do we start from? We again start from the born oppenheimers principle. So, what we say is your electron or your total combined wave function psi okay, is given by psi electronic. So, the electronic is referred to as E r comma r times psi vibrational this you can also write as psi nuclear which is n depending on r and this is equation 1. So, what is big r? Big r corresponds to what? The internuclear distance that means the nuclear coordinates r corresponds to what? The electron coordinates right. So, big r corresponds to the nuclear coordinates. and small r corresponds to the electron coordinates. So, what you can realize is if you split it up into two, the vibrational part depends only on what? The vibrational part depends only on what? The nuclear coordinates r right and this you know why because when you are talking when you are talking about the potential you do half k x squared what is x? x is essentially how much you are shifting from your equilibrium position r. Okay. It's x is essentially extension or compression whichever you look at it. Okay. Now, the electronic however, depends on two coordinates. One is the small r which is it's the coordinates as defined by itself by its own position and the other is defined by the nuclear coordinates too. Okay. It is obviously understood that when the electrons move the nuclear would not be moving they would be following, but still the nuclear would be moving. That means, your 
I mean your transition is also accompanied by a vibration, right? That's what it means. And the moment you have a vibration, that means your nuclear coordinates are also changing, right? So this type of dependence, so this type of dependence, that means psi electronic, so sorry, let me write psi electronic R, R, this is referred to as a parametric dependence on R. It is a parametric dependence on R. The parametric dependence on R again means that for each and every R, whatever R values are, which will help you give rise to a plot, you solve your electronic Schrodinger equation and you get psi electronic, you get E electronic and then you get the energy curve. Okay? This is referred to as parametric dependence. So, this is a starting point, right? Now, this is a starting point. So, what we have done is we have said that these two motions being independent, they can be decoupled from each other, but keeping in mind that the electron motion is still being governed not only by its own coordinates, but also by the nuclear coordinates. Okay? So, where do we go from here? See, it is like this. When you do quantum mechanics, there is one very important thing you always talk about. It is an operator. What does the operator do? What the operator does is, if you operate on a certain wave function with this operator, you will be able to do a certain action or a certain transformation, right? Okay? It is like matrix operations. So, similarly, if you would like to do a transition, you have to be able to operate on the molecule by an operator, the molecule being a quantum mechanical system by an operator and only after you do this operation will it make a transition. So, then you can understand what is going to happen is if you are going to find, if you are going to find a probability which is related to this probability of transition, that means to what extent the transition would be taking place, you would be actually solving what? You would be actually solving what? You will be actually solving something which corresponds to an expectation value, where the expectation value involves two things, two major things. One is the ground electronic wave function, the other one is the excited electronic wave function with an operator sandwiched between these two, because the operator makes this transition happen. As simple as that. You know that is why quantum mechanics expectation values are so important. So, if you are going for a position, what do you do? You take the position operator and sandwich in between the two wave functions, the same thing you do here. So, then our attention now for shifts to what is my operator. Okay? To think about it, it is very simple. When you are doing a transition, when you are doing a transition, what is essentially happening? You are shifting electrons from one place to the other place, from one orbital to the other orbital. Essentially, what you are doing is you are giving rise to a change in the charge distribution. Whenever you have a change in the charge distribution, this would be accompanied by a change in some sort of dipole moment. But this dipole moment is changing during a transition. Okay? Hence, it is referred to as a transition dipole moment or, or a transition moment. That is why it is called a transition moment or a transition dipole moment as was written on the title of the previous uh, sheet. Okay? So, then if it is the dipole moment we should be considered about, what we can write is the electronic rather the electric dipole moment operator can be written as mu with the hat on top being the operator is equal to minus E sigma i r i the small r referring to the coordinates of the electrons E being the charge plus E sigma alpha z alpha r alpha. Okay? So, this is equation number 2. So, see this can be further simplified as mu is equal to mu electronic, I always write here sorry mu electronic plus mu nuclear 3. So, that means your dipole moment has contributions from two things. One is because of the electron movement, 
and the other is because of the movement of the nuclei. Okay. So, if you would ever try to actually calculate something like this, you would introduce this dipole moment electric dipole moment operator. Okay. Now, what do we do? Because this is the operator, this operator is the one which brings about the transition. We take this and we sandwich it between the two wave functions we are concerned. One wave function belongs to S0 say the ground state and the other wave function belongs to the excited state right as simple as that. So, then what we define is we define something we define something known as m this m is referred to as the transition moment the m is referred to as the transition moment and we get the transition moment by solving an integral okay what is an integral so therefore m is in your direct notation m in your direct notation is given by psi mu psi so what is mu mu is the operator right which brings about this change after doing the operation you have this change from the ground state to the excited state okay what are these two psi's one psi say it's double prime belongs to the ground state and after you take the operator and operate on the ground state where do you go you go to the excited state and this psi is referred to as psi prime okay that psi is referred to as psi prime so this you can see is an integral in direct notation i'm sure you have done this in quantum mechanics right the direct the, the direct brown get notations right m is referred to as the transition moment it is also referred to as an integral because this is an integral essentially what you are solving finally you get a certain value which is the transition moment okay so this guys let me tell you if you are doing electronic spectroscopy this is something you will always have to deal with and this is finally what defi defines your absorption spectrum your fluorescence spectrum whatever you see it comes from here because it is an it is an overlap of two wave functions if you are doing an absorption it is an overlap between see if you are going to have an absorption then it is an overlap between your ground state and excited state if you are going to have an emission what will happen it is an overlap between your excited state and the ground state but it does not matter whenever you are having any transition what is going to happen is your electrons are going to move faster and the nuclei are going to follow follow it okay that is essentially always what happens so now this being the most important thing so this would be equation number 4 we need to solve it okay but you will see the solution is not that bad okay to get to the final expression that is what I mean what we do now is because we know that psi prime and psi double prime can both be split into what the electronic and the nuclear components of the electronic and the vibrational counterparts right then we expand this integral so what we say is now therefore m based on our discussion is equal to I will tell you why I am giving a double integral is equal to this what do you have the psi prime the psi prime can be written as psi e prime and because this is on this side it comes with a star psi v prime star it is like psi star h psi do you remember that when you would do an expectation value psi star h psi essentially that is what I am doing I am doing psi psi prime star then the operator then psi double prime your operator was mu so I write is mu out here times psi e psi v this is double prime double prime in the ground state okay then what you have is you would be having your volume elements but how many volume elements would you be having here how many volume elements will be having what are the coordinates involved good you will be having 6 volume elements that is true. So, essentially I can say without splitting each volume element into 3, but volume element will be having 2 though, huh? individual will be having 6 right. So, volume elements there will be 2 volume elements, one volume element will define will be defined by the coordinates of the electron, the other volume element will be defined by the coordinates of the nucleus. So, I would be having d tau e then d tau n. So, this would be equation number 5. Okay. With the thing 
remember that psi electronic depends upon small r and big r, psi vibrational depends only on big r. Right. So, then we go to the next step. What we now do is we split, we split this by doing psi e star psi v star, then mu can be written as what now? Mu has two components, right? One is mu electronic, the other one is mu nuclear. Did I write mu n or mu v? Okay, I write mu n, good. Then psi e psi v d tau e d tau n. Okay. So, hence you will be solving essentially two integrals, okay. one which would be having only the mu electronic as the operator, the other one would be having the mu nuclear as the operator. Okay. Let us do that quick. So, this can be split into two. So, I can write psi electronic star psi v prime star, then I can write mu e psi e double prime psi v double prime d tau e d tau n plus. Now, I will bring in the mu nuclear psi v prime star mu nuclear psi e psi v double prime d tau e d tau n. So, that means your transition moment is now a sum of two very generalized integrals, okay. one which has mu e and the other one which has mu n. Okay. Now, if it is mu e, which wave functions are going to be affected? See, it is the electronic dipole moment. So, which func wave functions would be going to be affected? Psi electronic, good. If it is mu n, which wave functions are going to be affected? Psi vibration, which is psi n essentially, right. Okay. So, you have to keep that in mind. Now, let us look, let us look at the second integral. Okay. Let us take a look at the. So, let this uh, be equation number 6 at the second term of equation 6. Let us look at the second term of equation 6. Let us see what we have. Okay. So, the second term can be written like this. Sorry. Psi v prime star psi v prime star okay let me write it again I missed one psi v prime star then i have mu n then psi v double prime okay i have another integral i should not be forgetting that integral which is psi e prime star psi e double prime let me put this in large brackets. Here I will be having d tau e, then I will be having d tau n. Okay. Is it okay with you how I have written it? What I have done is I have just separated out the nuclear component from the electronic component, keeping in mind that mu n will only be sandwiched between which ones? The psi n's, I've, which is essentially the psi v's. You will be having an integral which will be having psi e prime star psi e double prime with d tau e because that is the integral with electronic coordinates. And because your integral electronic integral also depends upon the nuclear coordinates that is why I have d tau n at the very last okay, because d tau n is like a further figure for everyone you know everything depends upon d tau n. Okay. Now, guys tell me what is the value of this integral? The answer is very simple. 1. Okay. What is the other binary digit? Very good. So, at least he pointed us to the answer, right. Okay. It is not 1, it is 0. Why? Tell me why you said 1. You can tell me why it is 0. Which, which one is orthogonal, right. Which one is orthogonal? The second integral is orthogonal. The second integral satisfies the orthogonality. Do you understand that? So, look at this one. 
So, if you look at this one, which is psi e prime star psi e double prime d tau e, would this be would not this be equal to 0? Would not this be equal to 0? For example, let us say this you taking you are taking a particle in a box, let us simple simplest example particle in a box, right. How many wave functions do you have? Say you start from n is equal to 1, you cannot go to n is equal to 0 particle in a box. So, you have psi 1, you have psi 2, you have psi 3 and so on. If you take an integral between psi 1 and psi d, what would it give you? Psi 1 and psi d would always go to 0 because of orthogonality, right. Because they are what they are energy functions of the same operator, which is the Hamiltonian, okay. Here too, the psi electronic double prime and psi electronic prime they are wave functions of what? The Hamiltonian, the electronic Hamiltonian of whatever system you are considering. Hence, they would be orthogonal. So, therefore, this is equal to 0 based on orthogonality. Okay. This would be equal to 0 based on orthogonality. Is this clear to you? Why it is orthogonal? Because if you would be solving hydrogen, say you are solving a simplest one, say you are solving say hydrogen atom, okay, you will be having this different quantum numbers n 1, 2, 3, 4, right. But if you would take psi n equal to 1, psi n equal to 2, right, if you do an integral what will you get? You will get 0, but then where, where do they come from? They come from solution of a single Schrodinger equation, where h is always defined for you. So, they belong that is what uh, that is what an orthonormal set is right. An orthonormal set is formed from that set of wave functions which are coming from the same operator and here these two belong to the same operator which is a h electronic that is why they are orthogonal to each other ok. Good. So, that is that means the equation or the expression is already simplified for us. So, what does equation 6 reduce to now therefore, equation 6 reduces to m equal to I can write psi electronic star psi p star mu e psi electronic double prime psi v double prime d tau e and d tau n let this be 7. So, this is the one I would be focusing on now because the other one is of no consequence to us, right? Okay. Now here too, guys, here too, I can split it into kind of I can bunch it into two, you know, groups. What are the groups? So this would be equal to I can write. So I can write psi e prime. Okay. Then I can write mu e this is star psi e double prime okay like this i always forget the volume 11 which is d tau e then psi v star psi v double prime d tau n okay i've already clumped it into two i've already clumped it into two right okay so this represents what? This represents what? This represents an electronic transition, this represents an electronic transition between two states psi e double prime which is the ground state, psi e single prime which is the excited state, right. I should not be writing psi e double prime, well psi e double prime is essentially means the ground state, but just keep that in mind, okay. Double prime means the ground state, okay. Then mu e. So, you take your dipole moment operator mu electronic, you operate it on the ground state psi e double prime, where do you end up in, uh, where do you end up? You end up in psi e single prime. So, this is your electronic transition. This is your electronic transition, okay. This is your electronic transition. Now, what am I left with? I am left with two vibrational wave functions 
one vibrational wave function belongs to the electronic ground state, the other vibrational wave function belongs to the electronic excited state. Now tell me, this is an overlap actually, but tell me would this be 0 or not? Hey, if this is 0, you know the answer is not 0, right? Because everything goes to 0, there will be no transition, no spectroscopy, we will not be talking about this, right? So you can safely now say that the answer is, hold on, not so quick, then the answer is not 0, right? The answer is not 0. Now tell me why is it not 0? Why was the previous one 0? Why is this not 0? There is a Well, I mean this is an overlap term you are looking at. This is an overlap integral you are looking at. Why is it not 0? The, the other one was also an overlapping in that sense. Why is this not 0? Why was the previous one 0? What is the difference? Operator, operator right? Operator, you are in the right direction. Is the operator same or not? Hey listen, when you are doing the electronic, when you are solving for the electronic, you are solving with only one Hamiltonian, right? When you go to vibration, what happens? When you go to vibration, you not only have your kinetic part, you also have your potential energy part, half kx squared, right? Now think about this, when you are when you're doing a transition, in most of the cases, what would happen is, you would give rise to a change in bond order possibly. In most of the cases, bond order or even you are shifting in distance. That means, there would be a shift in the equilibrium geometry. Well, it does not matter. The point is, if your bond order is changing, that means the force constant is changing, what is the potential for harmonic oscillator? Half kx squared, okay. But that kx squared, k is defined for each and every electronic state. So that means if you have the ground electronic state, your k would be k ground. If you if you have an excited electronic state, your k would be k excited. And in most of the cases, this k excited would not be equal, not be the same as k ground. Otherwise, you would not be observing any change at all. So that means when you're going, when you're solving for these two vibration levels, your Hamiltonian has already changed. And please remember now, they do not form an orthonormal set anymore, because the Hamiltonian has changed. Is this clear or not? It is not clear, okay. So let me write this and I will explain. So going forward, then m, the going forward, then m can be written as this, okay, can be generalized as this. I can write it as psi e mu electronic. So this is e means electronic. Psi e, uh, right? Okay. Double prime. Then I can write psi v prime. Sorry. Ah, I'm just making a mess of it. Anyway, sorry. So do not write this star here. Please remove the star read it again, psi v double prime. So, this essentially is psi e prime mu e, psi e double prime, psi v prime, psi v double prime. Okay. So, this is what your m is, this is your electronic transition as I wrote last time. This is referred to as vibrational overlap. Okay, this is referred to as vibrational overlap, right? It's overlap between two vibrational wave functions. Okay, so coming back to our discussion, coming back to our discussion, psi v prime and psi v double prime Brian R. belonging to two different electronic states are belonging to two different electronic states. First keep that in mind. Okay. Now, if that is so, if that is so, think about this. We were briefly discussing this last class. If you take ethene, right or ethylene. What you would do is, you would do an excitation. That means your HOMO which is highest occupied molecular orbital is filled with 2 pi electrons, right. 
you do make a transition from homo to lumo, what happens is you have one electron in the anti-bonding orbital essentially if you go by molecular orbital theory. Initially your bond order was what? 2. Now when you go to the excited state, what is your bond order? 1, right? Because the bond order is 1, you know, if you would ever want to do a cis trans isomerization on substituted acylins, you do an excitation and because then the bond order is 1, it will just move around the bond and then when it relax, you might get an equilibrium between cis and trans, okay? Dep depending on what you uh, start with, right? Now that is the way of doing an isomerization, but anyway, the idea was this, your Hamiltonian for a harmonic oscillator is what? It has a kinetic energy term and it has a potential energy term. So for a harmonic oscillator, for a Hamiltonian of a harmonic oscillator, HO, a harmonic oscillator would be given by a kinetic energy term and a potential energy term. Now, if you are considering a linear, that means a harmonic oscillator in one dimension, say x, what is v equal to? Half kx square, where x is the amount of change you do from the equilibrium position, right? Okay, now tell me this. If I am doing an ethylene, right? If I am doing an ethylene transition, one electron goes to the antibonding. In the ground state, V ground would be half K ground x squared, right? Okay. Let this be xg. V excited would be half K excited. x c squared. Now, this you should be able to recognize because this is of fundamental importance. The moment you make a change from a double bond to a single bond, is not your force constant changing? It has to change, right? Because you look at IR frequency, C double bond C, single, sing, uh, single bond C, all these frequencies come at different places. One bond is stronger than the other bond. So that means if you are making a change from a double bond to a single bond, would not k change too? Now the moment k changes, because your k is intrinsically involved in the Hamiltonian, is not your Hamiltonian changing too? Do you understand that or not? Because your potential is not changing, because you moved from one potential energy to a, a well to another potential energy well. Now because your Hamiltonian has changed, no longer are they orthogonal, because they do not belong to the same Hamiltonian. That was how you define an orthonormal set, if you go back to your postulates. Okay. So, that is why psi v times psi v prime times psi v double prime in general is never 0. Only in certain cases, now you can tell me when can it be 0? It can be 0 only when the potential energy in the upper excited state looks very similar to the potential energy in the ground state. Only in that case would there be no vibration overlap essentially that is what you are saying. That, that means this one would be almost gone. Okay. So then what we can write down is based on this discussion, so that means these are different. So based on this what we can write down now is psi v prime psi v double prime is not equal to 0 in general. So this guy again was referred to as the overlap integral, it is called the Frank Condon overlap. It is referred to as the Frank Condon overlap. It is referred to as a Frank Condon overlap. And the intensity of a transition, whatever intensity of a transition you see is essentially proportional to the square of this, is essentially proportional to the square of this. So for example, the intensity is proportional to psi v prime, psi v double prime squared and this square is called Frank Condon factor. This is called Frank Condon factor. So Frank Condon factor is just the square of your Frank Condon integral or overlap integral. Right? That is essentially what it means. So, what you just saw is that if you would ever want to know on what the intensity of a transition would 
depend it would depend upon this the square of this Frank on overlap. So, instead of dealing with the square it is easier for us to just deal with the overlap ok we just then we will square it later right ok. So, again having said this having said this what would the equation number be for this one. So, what was the last equation ok m I did not uh, uh, keep an equation here. So, if for uh, 7 uh, this one would be 8 is it if this one is 8 then I can say this one is 9 ok. Now, guys coming back to what we had derived before this m has two parts so one is the electronic transition and the other one is a vibration overlap. Now, do you under do, now do you realize why it is called a vibronic transition you, it is called a vibronic transition because when you derive the expression for m it is just not either vibration or not only electronic it is what it has the electronic transition moment integral times what the vibration overlap and these two give rise to a transition which is referred to as a vibronic transition. That means, whenever you are doing an electronic transition you will also have possible vibration overlap and that is vibration transitions would be occurring too. Is it clear what do you mean by vibration uh, vibronic transition? So, you would see so that is why you would see vibronic vibrations give rise to mixing of states. So, you would see that there are many transitions which are not allowed, but because of mixing they actually get allowed. You have you have you guys have all uh, read a lot of uh, you know these spectroscopic uh, these things like Laporte forbidden and all these things right ok this is essentially come from here. Even if some transition is forbidden you would see there is you know a little evidence of the transition occurring still and because of these mixing of wave functions you know that is where it comes from. But anyway so that is uh, not a point of uh, discussion right now. So, again this m is the transition moment integral this is what defines the probability of a transition the probability is essentially the number of molecules which would end up there in the excited state and then the number of molecules was would easily uh, transform to what the intensity which of, of, of you know the intensity of a transition essentially and hence intensity is proportional to your frank on overlap square ok. So, now coming back to see some of these effects on these slides. So, let us look at this. So, this was a frank corner transition ok. So, this was a frank corner transition as I said I would always go with a vertical transition. So, this is a vertical and I would never go for this ok. I can never have a change in nuclear coordinate. Now, what you can see here is see this is very important you look at the blue one right you look at the blue one in the ground electronic state you have vibration levels. So, v 0 v 1 v 2 in the excited electronic state you also have vibration levels you have to have right ok. Now, if you are talking about the ground electronic state which vibration level would be most populated it would be v 0 ok. So, based on room temperature based on thermal energy based on Boltzmann population most of the molecules the major 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 share of the molecules would be in v 0. That means, whatever transition you are looking at from the ground state would essentially happen from where would essentially happen from v is equal to 0 ok good. Now, if you look at the wave function where does it max the wave function maxes in the middle right. So, then if it is the middle of the well I mean this is your well if it is the middle of the well then the transition the maximum probability of the transition would be occurring from the middle. So, that is why you see this is occurring from the middle ok. Now, because the transition is vertical this would not care what has happened in the excited state it would just go up vertically straight ok tick fine. So, now it goes up vertically straight. Now, what you see is when you go and look at the excited electronic state is the excited electronic state same or different from that of the ground state in what way is it different tell me there is the difference in what way is it different tell me the most obvious way it is different what has happened. the nuclear coordinate has changed that means, if this is your if this is your r equilibrium for the ground state that means, for the ground state the r equilibrium for the excited state is not has not it changed. So, this is r equilibrium 
for the excited state. Hasn't that changed? That means what has happened? That means the average distance or the equivalent distance between the two nuclei has increased in the excited state. Now, that is what we were talking about in case of ethylene, right? If you would make it from a double bond to a single bond, obviously its length would increase. That means the distance between the nucleus, the, the, uh, the two nuclei would increase, the two atoms, okay? Right. Now, the moment you have it shifted, what has happened is the R equilibrium of the excited state is no longer on top of the R equilibrium of the ground state. Because if this is the R equilibrium of the ground state, based on this, it has already shifted here. Now, because it has shifted here, you see, when you do a vertical transition, where is the maximum overlap of this transition occurring? That means, in the ground state, it is V is equal to 0. With which state is it overlapping maximum? The third one, which is V2, right? So, that means, you can see the vibration overlap, which is the maximum, which is going to give you the maximum intensity, which is going to give you the maximum in intensity, is the transition from 0 to 2, where 0 is the V0 of the ground state, electronic state, and 2 is the vibration level with quantum number 2 of the excited electronic state. Okay? Now, keep this in mind. We are talking about the vibrational overlap. This is what your frank quantum overlap is, because the overlap is essentially what? Psi V prime, psi V double prime. You know, that is what you are looking at. Okay? Right? So, 0 to 2 would be giving you the maximum intensity in your transition. Okay? Now, tell me, would this be the only transition that is happening? First of all, remember, all the transitions have to start from V is equal to 0 level. You have no other choice. Even if you have smaller transitions up there, they would be very much masked. Okay? You have heard of something in vibration spectroscopy known as hot bands. Right? So, hot bands, you know how hot bands come from? So, that means if higher excited states are populated, right? But anyway, without going there, tell me what are the other or would there be other transitions possible in between the vibration levels? If they would be possible, why would they be possible? Tell me. See, this is not the only transition, try to keep that in mind. Telling the answer, this is not the only transition. If you look at a wave function, a wave function is just not peaking at one point, it is peaking at one point, but a wave function is a it's like this. It's and it's encompassing the whole place like this, right? So this is a wave function. So this is how your wave function goes, along with the tunneling parameters and all these things, right? So that means, if I'm having electron density here, if I'm going to do the probability density, then I I will also be having electron density here. That means I can also make a transition from here, right? So how do I draw? Okay. I can also make a transition from here. I can also make a transition from here. So on, right? So you will see in the later slides what happens is you do not just get zero to two because of this band. Because of this band, you will be getting multiple transitions, right? It's just not one transition. Now, what are these transitions? Uh, okay, let's just avoid this right now. I'll go to the transition and let you look at it. Here, this is what I was talking about. So, look at this. On the left panel, you have a nuclear configuration. In this nuclear configuration, you have a 0 to 1 transition. The 0 to 1 transition is your highest. The 0 to 1 transition means from V is equal to 0 in the ground state to V is equal to 1 in the excited state. Right? Now, this is your absorption intensity. That means, the intensity of a transition. Okay? The intensity of a transition. Now, look at this. 0 to 1, you can see has the maximum intensity, because that is the most probable transition has, that is happening. What is it defined by? It is defined by the overlap of a vibrational wave function, the frank quantum overlap. The higher is the value, the higher is the intensity. Okay? Now, because of this band, it is not so, uh, because of this band, because of this band, the other transitions like 0 to 4, 0 to 3, 0 to 2 would also be there. That means, it is 0 from, from 0 to v is equal to 3, from v is equal to 0 to v is equal to 4 and so on. But because here the vibration is not as high, the extent of uh, rather vibration overlap is not as high as that for which one? 0 to 1, hence their intensities would be lower. Okay. Now, the 0 to 0 transition, you can see this is a 0 to 0 transition. You can see this 0 to 0 transition. What does a 0 to 0 transition mean to you? 
a zero to zero transition means you're going from v is equal to zero in the ground state to v is equal to zero in the excited state. Now this zero to zero transition is referred to as a purely electronic transition. The zero to zero transition or zero to zero transition is referred to as a purely electronic transition. Do you know why? Why? Because in the electronic ground state, your molecules are populated in the v is equal to zero. In the vibrational state, or rather in the excited state, the molecules are also there in the zero level. So if you're doing a zero to zero, the molecules have to be in the zero vibration level, right? There is no other way. They have to be in the zero vibration level. That means you're making from zero to zero. No other vibration level in the excited state is involved in that transition corresponding to that wavelength or that frequency and is referred to as a purely electronic transition. Okay. Now similarly look at this. Let's next look at uh, the right panel. See in the right panel what has happened is the R equilibrium has shifted a lot. Because the R equilibrium has shifted a lot as opposed to the previous case where 0 to 1 was the maximum transition. In this case it is no longer 0 to 1. What is the maximum intensity? It is not 0 to 4. It is 0 to 4 again simply because the wave function of your fourth vibrational state in the excited state has a maximum overlap with the wave function of your v is equal to 0 in the ground state and that is why it has the maximum intensity out there. Okay, again as simple as that. But again because if you have, you, you have an you have a band and hence you would be looking at an envelope of transitions. So this guys whatever this uh, this you are looking at these two this is referred to as a Frank Condon envelope. This is referred to as a Frank Condon envelope. Frank Condon, Frank Condon means just a vertical transition why is it envelope? Envelope means it is just not one transition it is encompassing or it is enveloping under the shed a series of transitions 0 to 1, 0 to 2, 0 to 3, 0 to 4 and which one will be having the maximum intensity would be defined by the overlap integral essentially that is how it goes. right? So this is also referred to as a you know a vibronic overlap or rather vibronic envelope rather or Frank on envelope and this is often seen this is often seen if you would take absorption spectra especially of uh, well organic molecules if you take absorption spectra you would always uh, you would often see bands coming up like this which are referred to as your vibronic bands and your vibronic bands just tell you that I have or you have excitations to higher vibration levels in the excited state starting from the ground state vibration level of your ground state of a ground electronic state. Okay. So just to wrap uh, this up, uh, so I have talked about the vertical transition. So again the Frank Condon principle states that since the time required for an electronic transition is very small compared to that of nuclear motion, the most probable vibronic transition is the one which involves no change in nuclear coordinates that we know. Next this transition often referred to as the Frank Condon maximum represents a vertical transition on your potential energy diagram this we have seen. Okay. Now what does this say? Look at the left panel it says no vibronic coupling. Why does it say no vibronic coupling? Now look at this what has happened is what has happened is your R is equal to 0 rather your R equilibrium in the ground state and your R equilibrium in the excited state are very similar. Can you see? So this one and this one they are almost at the same R that means your equilibrium distance is not shifted between the nuclei because it has not shifted guys because it has not shifted because it has not shifted. So V is equal to 0 level would be right on top of V is equal to 0 level. So V is equal to 0 in the grounds in the excited state would be right on top of V is equal to 0 to the ground. So which one would be having the maximum overlap anyway? The 0 to 0 transition and because it is a 0 to 0 transition if you talk as I said if you are talking about any electronic state your molecules would not be having a choice but to stay in this V is equal to 0 state. So that means this is not involving any higher vibration levels and hence it is a called a pure electronic transition no vibration levels involved that is what 0 to 0 is. Okay. So now you can understand how do you get vibrational bands how do you get vibronic bands. So if you go to the next one what has happened is now it is no longer the R equilibrium is no longer the same in the ground and the excited state shifted and the moment you shift the transition remaining a vertical transition 
it will still go up, but it will overlap with another v, uh, another v in the excited state. So, say in this case it is v is equal to 1 and because you are having a change in the vibrational corner number say from 0 to 1, these being of two different electronic states, here you are having vibronic coupling. Okay? That means, this is a vibronic transition, where you not only having an electronic transition, electronic transition means that you are going from S 0 to S 1 or ground electronic state to excited electronic state that itself is an electronic transition. Not only that, but also when you are moving to the electronic electronical excited state, you are occupying higher vibration levels of the electronic state right? and that is why it is called a vibronic transition. Okay? So, we will stop here. So, this is essentially what your absorption spectroscopy is all about in terms of the theory. If you are talking about fluorescence, which we will do in the next class, fluorescence is just the reverse of this. So, you would see if you are getting an absorption uh, overlap for the absor uh, your overlap in the absorption, you are going to get a similar overlap in the fluorescence, because those are the ones which are going to come down vertically too, right? giving rise to something known as mirror image symmetry. So, and after that we will uh, move on to uh, Lambert Beer's law, look at some issues in absorbance and try to uh, move into fluorescence. Okay? So, that is it for today.